fiction only lets you use your imagination, but you can create a composite truth out of multiple realities that you are blending together that are as truthful as one single reality, which is what journalism allows for ethical reasons. And I enjoy that. I love the opportunity to tell something that feels very authentic, that people can really relate to, that actually didn't happen. That's the power of fiction. That's why it's so important. From the University of Tulsa and Public Radio Tulsa, this is Switchyard, a podcast for people hungry for eye-opening essays, moving fiction, soul-stirring poetry, and honest, thought-provoking conversation. I'm Ted Genoways, editor of Switchyard Magazine, and your host. Join me and our lineup of literary all-stars as we think through and hash out our world's difficult and fascinating challenges. In this episode, I talk with author Antonio Ruiz Camacho about his short story, The Search Zone, published in the summer 2023 issue of Switchyard. If you haven't heard the version of this story that we produced as a radio play, I encourage you to check that out first. In our conversation, Ruiz Camacho and I discuss his background as a writer and how his early work as a journalist provided the foundation for his haunting story. Antonio, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you here for this conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Ted. It's my pleasure. Most people who know you, they know you as a writer of fiction, a writer in English. But I wanted to start by getting a little bit of your background, a little of your personal story, and how you became the writer that you are today. I was born and raised in Mexico City's suburbia called Toluca. It's like 40 miles west of Mexico City. Small industrial town, sleepy town. I lived there until I graduated from high school. And then I moved to Mexico City to go to college. I majored in communications with a minor in journalism. And I immediately was drawn to journalism when I was in college because of the opportunity that it would give me to write and to tell stories, but also to pursue a regular job, quote unquote, something that could pay the bills. It was very ingrained in my upbringing. No one from my family was a writer or an artist or did anything that would remotely have to do with any creative endeavor. So I figured that journalism would be the one opportunity that could put me closer to being a storyteller without disappointing my parents further. So you had an interest in storytelling from a young age. Yeah. I mean, I started just scrabbling and writing these poems and lines since I was in middle school. I remember I couldn't sleep. I would have to get out of bed and just start writing these ideas, these stories that would flash through my head. And I didn't know why. I thought it was a teenage condition that would eventually go away. (laughs) My maternal grandmother at some point claimed to have given me those kind of powers because when she was young, in order to make some extra income, she would write love letters on demand. People would come to her and ask her to write these love letters. She was a very, very dry, very unromantic woman. (laughs) And yet she would have the ability to write these love letters that apparently were very successful because her customers would keep coming back asking for more. So that's my only connection to storytelling in my family tree. My father was a politician and businessman, very successful in Mexico. The expectation was that I would become an attorney or a CEO of some company or something like that. So the idea of him having a writer as a son never crossed his mind. So I was like, okay, maybe becoming a journalist won't be that disappointing. I think I still disappointed him, (laughs) but at least I could make a living. I could get a job and have a salary. At the beginning, how did you get going and become a journalist? From the very beginning, what I wanted 
to do is tell these long stories, like reportage. Very early in college, I discovered The New Yorker, and there's a very important Spanish language newspaper that comes from Spain called El País. And they had this weekly magazine, El País Semanal, and I would just devour the reportages. And I would dream of becoming one of those journalists that would travel around the world or at least the country telling these stories. So the first job that I got was like an editor. I don't know exactly how to describe it. This very important newspaper in Mexico City called Reforma, which was the biggest newspaper at the time. And it's still one of the most important newspapers in Mexico today. They had a regional service where they would provide these customized editions of their international business news to regional newspapers. So we had to kind of like customize stories that would be printed in the regular Reforma for a number of services across Mexico. So at some point when I was there, I think we have seven different clients. So I will have to rewrite the same story for seven different editions, depending right. wow. on the advertising space that we had on each page. And while I was doing that, I was just knocking the doors on the editors in other desks like culture and business, trying to get my foot in the door and try to get them to publish some of my stories. I would try to write stories about social groups, like religious groups. I would interview writers and try to have those interviews published in the arts and culture section. And a year later, I got the opportunity to join the arts and culture section, kind of like as a junior reporter. I was supposed to write reportage, but since I didn't have a beat, I became kind of like the firefighter reporter, <laughs> the one right. junior reporter that would be just like summoned anywhere if there was a breaking news that no other reporter wanted to cover. At the time, I hated it, but I think it really gave me the opportunity to develop this quick writing style. You have to absorb the information and get sources on record on the fly and get the story published the next day. And then the following day, you jump to another story. And that's how I started, really. And then how long did you work as a journalist in Mexico? On and off like for five, six years. At some point I moved to Spain and was like a stringer for a Mexican newspaper writing stories from Spain. And then I went back to Mexico and got a job as an investigative reporter for this same newspaper. And I had the ability to kind of like, as it was my dream, travel around the country writing stories about immigration and poverty and natural disasters. So as I was traveling across the country, writing the stories about immigration and poverty and natural disasters, that's how I came across this story based in Chiapas that inspired the short story that you published. And then eventually my wife and I moved to Spain, where we lived for three years. And around that time, I stayed away from journalism, and that's how I started writing fiction. I had been writing fiction in college, some short stories. I was part of a writing group that would workshop stories and basically get drunk every Saturday sure. in yes. the afternoon. I wrote a lot of poetry, short fiction, but never really considering that it would become a serious endeavor for me until I lost the ability to write stories and to tell stories for a living. When I was living in Spain, I got this job in a publishing house, kind of like a marketing associate. So all I could write was like these brief descriptions of essays, long essays or nonfiction books, that description that you read on the back of the book. And right, right. that was all I could write. And that's where I very naturally, almost instinctively gravitated toward writing fiction again. And was your instinct right away to write in English? How did that come about? Up until then, I was still writing Spanish. Spanish sure. is my first language, as you can see from my accent. I kept working on that novel that I started writing in Spanish for basically nine years. Oh, wow. During that time, I got a job offer to join a chain of Spanish language newspapers that was launching in Texas as a managing editor with the Austin paper. And that's how my family and I moved to Austin in 2004. But I was a managing editor. I was not writing any stories of my own. So on the side, I kept working on this novel. And then around 2008, I got 
a journalism fellowship, the Knight Fellowship at Stanford University. And I secretly wanted to turn that fellowship into a mini MFA. Sure. I wanted to improve my writing and to have the opportunity to explore other professional opportunities beyond Spanish language media in the U.S. Because at that time, I mean, there weren't a lot of job opportunities to keep growing as a journalist. And we wanted to stay here in the U.S. So I joined the fellowship at Stanford in, in the fall of 2008 and started taking creative writing classes. But there were no creative writing classes in Spanish. All they had was classes in English. And it's funny because I didn't even know how important Stanford was for creative writing. I didn't know that they had right. the Stegner Fellowship. And the first class I took was a creative nonfiction class with Maria Hummel, who was a Stegner Fellow and who had been to Brett Love many times. And it was the first time that I had to write in English. I knew English. I learned English since I was in kindergarten. But my English was very rusty. And it was the first time that I had to write in English. Even in my job as a journalist, working for four years in the U.S., we had to do some work in English, like emails, things like that. But all the content that we would publish was in Spanish. So this was like a huge change for me. How did you start writing in English? Were you initially taking work that you'd written in Spanish and translating it into English. To me, it's such a hard thing to imagine writing in a second language. It's hard enough to feel like you have some level of mastery of your native language. To mm -hmm. just be functional in another language is amazing, but to be literary is kind of hard for me to even understand what the process for that would be. So how did you approach this initially? I approach it with zero expectations, I was very oblivious to what I was doing, honestly. I thought, whatever I write here is going to suck. It's going to be terrible. I hope people at least understand it enough so they can provide some feedback. And eventually, this kind of feedback and approach to writing will be useful to me when I go back to writing in Spanish. Never did for a second cross my mind at that moment that I would end up publishing a book in English or writing in English for a living. Never. If you told me that at that moment, I would just have laughed, <laughs> thought that you were being very facetious with me. So I started immediately writing English. I didn't write in Spanish. I didn't draft in Spanish and then translate it to English. I just jumped into the water and tried to swim with whatever I had. And I think that really helped because I had zero expectations and the feedback immediately was overwhelming. Everybody in class was blown away with whatever I wrote, especially Maria. I still get emotional thinking about her and her feedback because she literally changed my life. The kind of feedback that she would write, she would ask us to write these prompts that were like a page long and she would give you back a two-page letter of feedback. She was that generous. And her feedback was just overwhelming. It was like, wow, this is <laughs> really? <laughs> is this actually good? Obviously, my writing was riddled with grammatical errors because I was still operating with a Spanish language brain. Right. I was older when I started writing in English. And that's something that I struggled with later on when I realized that I want to pursue these more seriously. I thought that I had to write like a native speaker, otherwise my writing wouldn't be good enough. And when I tried to do that, I failed miserably until I realized that part of the feedback that I was receiving, that I received from the very beginning, was that my writing was different and somehow fresh because I was writing with a wired brain of a Spanish language speaker. Yeah. So I embraced it. And I embraced the fact that whenever I turn something in, either a short story or an essay, I know that part of the feedback that I'm going to receive from an editor will be basic grammatical <laughs> stuff, because it's inevitable. But I can contribute to this debate and to the arts, it's based on the freshness of having this unique voice. One of the things that I just love about 
your writing is that there are turns of phrase that are recognizable as English that we understand. But as you said, it comes from a brain that is wired differently. And especially in the pieces that are writing about the kind of world that you're writing about, the world of people who live in Mexico, the world of people who have a transnational experience and existence, it only makes sense that the voice would carry some ghost of that experience in, in its expression as well. So to me, it's a thrilling kind of English that is slightly hybridized, but it's also just very specific to the world that you're writing about. Well, first of all, thanks. That's very generous <laughs> of you. Your comments reminded me of Maria's. There's also the thing that regardless of what language I write in, I've always loved playing with the language. To me, it's kind of like a Lego set. I love it. When I was writing in Spanish, I would try to play with the language all the time. The result was different because it's a different language. But one thing that I discovered as I kept writing more and more in English and really becoming familiar and intimate with the English language is how playful it is and how flexible it is. Yes. It's such a generous, welcoming language. If you think and work really, really hard, you can come up with a wonderful image in English that's made of two words. Right. Doing that in Spanish is very difficult because Spanish has a different mechanism to it, and it's just different. And I fell in love with that experience. I fell in love with the challenge of playing with this language that was not originally mine, but that really received me with open arms. And did you have writers who were influential or formative for you as you were trying to make that transition? Writers who gave you some version of English that you felt was your own? Well, after I finished the fellowship at Stanford, it was a year-long fellowship. At some point, when I expressed Maria my interest in pursuing further this opportunity, she was like, you need to keep going. This is great. What else do you think that you can do? And I was like, I want to be a writer, regardless of the language. I have been working on a novel in Spanish for nine years. After that, I submitted it to contests and agents and editors in Mexico and Spain. And it was as if I was submitting into a black hole because I never received not even a rejection letter. So I was oh, like, well, yeah. I obviously suck as a writer, so I need to improve. So I wanted to keep trying, but I was not adamant about doing it in English. I thought it was very difficult. It was inconceivable to me at that point. But Maria suggested that I apply to Bretloff, the Writers Conference in Vermont, probably the most renowned Writers Conference in the world, of which I was completely oblivious, of course, <laughs> right? Sure. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And she was, again, generous enough to work with me on an essay for a couple months during the winter break. I submitted it and I got accepted as a contributor. I understood what it meant to be accepted into Bread Love, and even more so because I was writing in my second language. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep doing this. I went to Bredlov in the summer. Again, the feedback was incredible. I talked with a few agents. They were immediately interested in whatever I was working on. I was supposedly working on a memoir about my upbringing in Mexico based on that essay that I submitted to Bredlov. And when I came back, that's when all the pressure started to kick in because I had no job. I was living off my savings. I just wanted to apply to an MFA, see what happened. And then I had these agents in New York waiting for <laughs> my memoir <laughs> excerpt. Right. And that's when I decided, or I felt that I needed to write like a native speaker. So I wrote something up. It was awful. Obviously, all the agents I sent it to kindly passed. I was very depressed asking, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life and your savings and everything? I had two kids. And then one day at this secondhand bookstore, I stumbled upon The Year of Magical Thinking by John Didion, from whom I had read an essay 
at Stanford, at Maria's class. And goodbye to all that. Right. Okay. And that's why I was immediately drawn to the year of magical thinking. That book also changed my life, not just because the way that Joan Didion used grammar. She invented her own grammar. She For didn't sure. care yeah. about the rules. But there's a specific section in that book where she says something to the effect of, I never learned the rules of grammar. I only followed my instinct to what sounded right to me. And when I read that, it was as if Joan Didion was giving me permission to embrace my own flawed version of the English language, that as long as it sounded right to me, it could work. And I went back to it. I started working on my MFA application, a short story that I submitted, and I got admitted into an MFA at UT Austin. So Didion was very, very seminal to me. She was very important. She gave me the permission to pursue this, but also she taught me how to do it because she does that all the time in her own writing. Well, a fine teacher, to be sure. <laughs> and it's true. The English of her essays, it's certainly not colloquial English. It's not English as it's spoken. She's inventing her own language and her own grammar as well. So yeah, that makes sense. She also talks about the fact that she sort of taught herself to write by sitting down and typing Hemingway's work and getting to understand the rhythm and the cadences of his sentences. So of course, that's a tradition that you're participating in of finding one writer who sort of unlocks the door for the next. Absolutely. With a caveat that after I got admitted to the New Writers Project, the MFA at the English Department at the University of Texas at Austin, I decided that I wanted to take an English grammar class. So in my first semester, mm -hmm. I took an English grammar class with Tom Cable, who was retiring that year and who was an institution at UT. And the reason I did that was because I felt similar to what John Didion was saying or suggesting. I knew that I didn't want or I couldn't even write like a native speaker. That was not my goal. But I needed to understand the language, the mechanics of the language well enough so that I could break them. You don't know yeah. how to break something if you don't know how it works, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I don't think Hemingway had to take a grammar class <laughs> in college. Well, well who yeah. knows? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'll bet they took grammar classes in high school or middle school. It is an interesting thing. I mean, I think you're right, of course, that you have to understand all of the rules well enough in order to know when you're breaking them for a creative effect as opposed to just not knowing the proper way of doing things. But I think the native speaker very often doesn't, never has that instinct, never has that other sound in their head, that ghost of another language that inhabits that cadence mm -hmm. or that structure. So even once you've had this grammar course that teaches you some of these rules, it's not as if it irons out the things that are particular to your way of approaching the language. I do wonder though, your subject matter for the most part has been Mexico and a kind of Mexican diaspora. And in many ways, not just that broader subject, but the particulars of life in Mexico that are really informed by the journalism that you did for years. You have an approach that is very systemic in understanding how events in one place can affect events in others and how people and families are interconnected, how violence can kind of resonate throughout the spider web of connections. So I wonder, as you're building your abilities as a fiction writer, it seems to have brought you back to some of the same things that concerned you as a journalist. Yeah, there are two schools of thought. Some people say, well, write about the things that you know. Other people think, well, write about the things that you don't know so you can explore them and get to know them. For my fiction, everything that I write has to be based in reality, deeply, deeply rooted in reality. And I keep just trying to do the same that I was doing when I was working as a journalist in Mexico, which is trying to understand this place that I came from. 
Right. And I'm just trying to understand that and trying to give it meaning. I grew up in a family where one side of my family was working class, almost poor. The other side of my family was very, very wealthy. So I was like constantly struggling in having these two very separate, very distant, very different worlds. And I think when you look at those stark differences and complexities as a child, you are just confused all the time. You're trying to understand why this is the way it is, why this is this place that I was in yesterday is so different from the place that I am now today and why I belong in two different places at the same time that are part of the same country. And that's what I try to do in my writing constantly. There's this constant exploration of all the different Mexicos that are part of this big place called Mexico. And at the same time, as I was working on my story collection, for example, in the MFA, I was very aware that because I was writing it in English and I wanted to publish that book that I was working on here, the first and natural audience for that book. And one of my mentors at UT, who's now a very close friend of mine, Oscar Casares, who collaborated with us on this story, he is from Brownsville, a small town on the border along the Texas-Mexico border. It's a very unique place, what's called the Rio Grande Valley. And he had faced similar questions about writing about this very unique place that's almost unknown in the rest of the states, let alone New York, where his stories were going to be published. And I remember he once told me, if you're going to write about a place that's very specific, you just write about that place without becoming a tour guide. What's local is universal. What happens to the characters in my stories can happen to people in other places. Like the dynamics are going to be different, but are going to help readers who have never been to those places relate to them. So I'm basically just trying to understand the place for myself, for my own benefit, right. and bring readers along. This is exactly the thing that I loved about Barefoot Dogs, your collection of stories. There's a way in which you're obviously providing access into this world. But exactly as you said, we're not being led along by the hand. We're entering at a certain point, and every story seems to lead us in slightly different directions. It's almost like it's turning over a problem. And each story is adding a layer of complexity and a new dimension, and not just to the kind of threads of narrative that connect those stories, but as you said, to the story of Mexico itself. And I wonder, so much of the American perspective on Mexico focuses very specifically on immigration issues, specifically on border issues, in a way that seems to really kind of narrow and limit our understanding of Mexico as a country and a culture. As a writer, do you have that in the back of your mind that you're trying to reach a reader who may not know these things to complicate their view of your home country? Or is that just something that kind of happens naturally and that you can't avoid doing? Yeah, more of the latter. It's something I can't avoid. Now, more recently, I'm starting to write about Mexicans living in the U.S. and meshed yeah, sure. in dramas with proper Americans, if you will, <laughs> or like first-generation Americans, or like regular Americans. How do you even call them? <laughs> because now my experience for many years has been that. I right. feel now so close to Austin, for example, as a city, as I did to Mexico City or my hometown. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's something that I can't really avoid. Like Once I have these characters and these stories come to me, then I can organize the narrative in a way that can be accessible to my readers, assuming that my readers are primarily in the US. And it's not that I'm purposely staying away from the immigration debate or the drug wars debate. It's just not the reality that I lived. Right. My immigration experience is very different from 
other Mexican immigrants experience. Talking about Mexican immigration is kind of like reductionist because there are so many different experiences. But what's interesting to me, again, because it's something that I've seen for a long time, is the race relations, the class relations, the power dynamics, the politics of race and class and money. I'm really drawn to that because it's something that I lived with when I was growing up. And I also think it's a fascinating topic. And I think writing about people who seemingly have it all and yet have something to lose when they are facing some sort of fate that they were not expecting, it's almost like a Greek tragedy. And I love just giving humanity to people that you think shouldn't have one or shouldn't want for one because they have everything. I was very drawn to Succession, the series, which a lot of people love it. A lot of people hate it for the same reason, for <laughs> the characters who are so insufferable. And to me, it was exactly that. I was very drawn to the writing and to these characters because I've seen similar people in real life around me for a long time. And I thought it's very interesting to try to push a reader or an audience to ponder the question of compassion or relatability to somebody with that kind of profile. And it has nothing to do with the origin of these people. I mean, in the case of the characters that I write about, many of them are of Mexican origin because that's where I come from. But it's not like I have this agenda that, oh, I need to contribute a different point of view to the issue about Mexico. So tell me with this particular story, the search zone that is in the first issue of Switchyard, the setting of the story is Morozintla in Chiapas, and there has been a natural disaster. I don't know for certain, but it seems to be set in the real world of the kind of flooding disaster that happened there in 1998. Talk a little bit about what the story is about, but then where it came from for you. Yeah, the story is about this journalist, this young journalist from Mexico City who's been sent to Chiapas to write about these floods. Obviously, there's a whole backstory to that. And he's young. He's trying to make a difference. He's trying to write a different kind of story. He wants to do something different. So he visits this shelter for refugees at night because he wants to get a sense of the place. He wants to write about the people who have survived this and how they are coping with it. And when he visits this shelter, he meets somebody from the military who's in charge of the shelter. And they start talking and he realizes that this guy has a very interesting story because he's supposedly to be protecting the people who lost everything, but he's also facing his own demons. He's been through some sort of traumatic event while he was out in the field helping survivors of these floods. And now he is also at the shelter, supposedly helping others, taking care of the people, but actually he's been taken care of. And I really like this dynamic of somebody who's supposedly so powerful as a soldier who is rendered so fragile and vulnerable. And this main character, who seems to be based on you, has a really suggestive name. He's Daniel <laughs> Proust. Uh <-huh. laughs> Tell us about selecting this name for your character. That's completely random. <laughs> it sounded mysterious. You don't see him as a Proustian figure, that this is something of the conjuring of memory? I think maybe he could be, but I don't know. I always felt I'm a journalist writing fiction and not an actual author, like a scholarly author right. who could quote Proust. I'm not at that level. So I like <laughs> to subvert people's expectations about what they are about to read. So if you read a story about a Mexican reporter in Mexico City and you're reading that in English in the U.S., you might not expect his name to be Daniel Proust. 
Right. I like to keep readers on their feet. <laughs> <laughs> and Tony, just from a literal standpoint, is this one of the disasters that you covered when you were working as a journalist? Yeah, I had just come back from Spain. I had been living in Spain for six months, writing for this newspaper. And when I went back to Mexico City, my goal was to get hired full-time as a Spain correspondent, to go back to Spain and write for this newspaper. But the editor that I knew there knew that I wanted to tell a different kind of story. So he was like, hey, I mean, this disaster in Chiapas struck, and do you want to go tell these other stories from a more human point of view? It was like, yes, absolutely. And I was terrified because it was the first time that I was doing that, and I didn't know how I would move around there, how I would get into the towns that were isolated up in the mountains. I didn't know anything, so I was terrified and super excited about it. And that actually happened to me. I went to this shelter. I couldn't get in because there were soldiers outside. I came back later at night. There was no one at the door. I got in. I got into one of the big areas where they had cots for all these people who had lost their homes and everything. And I was there, and these soldier, I can't remember his range, he saw me there and we started talking. And it was very interesting to me how I realized that at first, like he wanted me to leave because I was not supposed to be there. But then I realized that what he really wanted was just to be able to talk with somebody about the situation. Mm -hmm. He couldn't talk about it with the people at the shelter because he would probably come across as frail. He would lost credibility or his authority. He couldn't talk with other people at the military for the same reasons. So he was alone. And I wrote a series of stories for the newspaper at that moment. But that moment with him, with this guy, really stuck with me. And then in many years later, it came back in the form of a fiction story. I'm not surprised to learn. This really is the first time I'm hearing that this is based in autobiographical detail, but it feels that way. It feels granular and specific and knowledgeable of the place. And yet there's also something in what fiction allows you to do that elevates it to a level where it feels allegorical at times and it feels otherworldly at times. But to me, otherworldly in a way that actually makes it feel strangely more rooted in the real world than journalism often is. There's an admitting of the magical, the unexplained. I wonder now, as you've got some distance on those years as a journalist, but looking back on some of those things, the extent to which that flexibility in fiction is kind of the driving force for you. I mean, it seems to me that your fiction, to use the word that you used earlier, it has the permission to do things that journalism often doesn't. If fiction only lets you use your imagination, but you can create a composite truth out of multiple realities that you are blending together that are as truthful as one single reality, which is what journalism allows for ethical reasons. And I enjoy that. I love the opportunity to tell something that feels very authentic, that people can really relate to, that actually didn't happen. It's very obvious and it's cliche, but that's, that's the power of fiction. That's why it's so important. There's an exchange between Proust and General Martinez about the smell that is present in the disaster zone. And the way that this smell seems to sort of take hold and you can't get away from it. And it haunts you even after you've left that place. Is that drawn from your own sense memory? Is that something that you remember specifically from Motozintla or from other such areas? Or is that a product of your imagination? Gratefully, no, I don't have that direct memory from that place. But I think, I mean, Smell is this thing that we sometimes forget to use as a narrative device in fiction. And it's so evocative and so powerful. I'm always reminding myself to use that 
in fiction because visual memories can be misleading. Even sensorial memories, your touch can be misleading. Smells are so specific. They can be misleading too because you might smell something that you feel is one thing, but it's a different thing. But what it conveys in terms of emotion is very specific. And I felt that that would be a very powerful connection between these two characters. Right. Because it's a kind of thing, the smell of dead people, basically, in the brie, that right. you cannot recreate, but you can relate to other people, to somebody else, if they have also experienced it. As our listeners may know, this has been transformed into an audio play. The story itself is in the form of a dialogue. It's kind of a script. And so it just made sense for us to give life to that form by allowing you to portray Daniel Proust and then one of your mentors, Oscar Casares, to portray General Martinez. Mm -hmm. What was it like, the experience of playing some version of yourself, some fictionalized version of yourself, and essentially reenacting a fictionalized version of this thing that actually happened to you? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was fun, but also very stressful. <laughs> because when you have to do that, you're basically performing, right? Like you're an actor, you're performing a character, and it's not something that I was expecting to have to do. <laughs> and also you were saying, yeah, it's like a fictional version of yourself. My usual response is, no, that's not me. That's a fiction. You know, like that's the reason I write fiction because you have this shield of fiction where you can say everything, even if, if everything is about yourself, you can always say, it's not about me. It's just fiction. Because to me, even when I'm reading it or when I'm writing it, I never see myself in my characters, even if they are very close to me, as Daniel could be. They are always characters. They are their own entity and they have their own identity. Also because I think when you are using your own material or your own life, your own experiences, your own traumas to write fiction or creative nonfiction, you have to put enough distance with your own experiences so that they become material quote-unquote, not your own life. Because if it still feels too raw, too close to you, then you're going to do a disservice to the story and to that character. Because you're going to turn that piece of writing into some sort of therapy or catharsis. But you have to be far away from it so that you can manipulate it. You can use it as narrative material. And that's how I feel about anything that I use from my own life when I use it in fiction. That makes sense to me. It's interesting because we often think of journalism or nonfiction as being the genre that establishes narrative distance. There's objectivity that takes the experience of the writer out of it. But in some ways, what could be more distancing than taking our own experience and giving it to someone else? And I suppose, while it's true that you're Daniel, and you're also General Martinez in some form, and everyone in the story becomes some version of you. Yeah, because I use different parts of myself or different experiences that I've had, emotions, even points of view about the same situation that can be contradicted, and I put them into different characters. I have a story in the book in the collection, in one of the creative writing classes that I used to teach, I would do this exercise where I asked the students to read that story and try to identify what parts of me were in what character. And they were always surprised to hear that the one character in that story that had most from me, or that had more elements about my own experience was a female character. That's the fun of writing fiction. It was a pleasure working with you on this story, Antonio. And I can't thank you enough for contributing to the issue and for coming to the inaugural Switchyard Festival here in Tulsa. And of course, for joining us here on the podcast. It's been a great pleasure. <laughs>
This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Switchyard. I'm your host, Ted Genoways. If you liked this episode and you want to support our podcast, please share it with your friends, post about it on social media, and leave a rating and review. Switchyard is a production of the University of Tulsa and Public Radio Tulsa. We made this episode with executive producer Marianne Andre and Charles Lipper and Cass Ali at Volubility Podcasting. Special thanks to TU President Brad Carson 